In 1990, Gillside House was a shadow of its former self. It had long stood abandoned, its walls had crumbled and its windows smashed. On the 26th of May, 1990, two local boys ventured into the abandoned building, where they made a gruesome discovery. They found the body of 14-year-old Simon Martin. Like most kids before the internet and mobile phones, he would spend hours playing outside with his friends, as long as he was home when the street lights came on. Although a local man was charged with the crime, the charges were later dropped and it would be over 20 years before Simon Martin's killer was brought to justice. In 1975, in Sunderland, Judy and Thomas Kelly welcomed their son, Thomas Jr. And four years after Thomas was born, they had a daughter, Lindsay, to whom Thomas was a loving brother. At 18, Thomas was attending college and working as a mechanic. The 26th of November 1993, Thomas had failed to return home from college. His parents began searching for him. It was out of character for Thomas to not let his parents know his plans. The following day, and they turned on the local news to hear that a body had been found. The family contacted the police to be told that the body could not currently be identified as it had been too badly burned. Later that day, Thomas Sr. and Judy sat in the living room. When they heard a key turn in the lock, they rushed to the hallway, their mood lifted by the sound, only for their hopes to be crushed as two police officers stepped through the door. They had found the key on the body and the police had now confirmed the person's identity as Thomas Kelly. The Kelly family's grief was further compounded when Thomas's death was written off as mysterious but not suspicious. The post-mortem report stated that a cause of death could not be determined due to the extensive damage caused by the fire. The police concluded that he had died whilst using drugs and the case was closed. At 8.30pm on Tuesday the 8th of February, the fire brigade responded to a property on Rockets Terrace. Inside the abandoned house, they discovered the remains of a boy and signs of a fire. An investigation began, which led the police to the home of Sheila and John Hansen, who had reported their son missing at 12pm the previous day. David Hansen was born on the 31st of October 1978. He grew up in a loving household with his mum Sheila, his dad John and his older sister Joanne. Reports highlighted his caring nature and on the 8th of February he went to visit his grandmother to whom he shared a close bond. He headed home at 6pm but never arrived. After providing the police with a brief description of what David had last been wearing, the family's worst fears were confirmed. Their child was dead. His parents would describe how David loved being with his friends. He took pride in his appearance, ensuring his hair was perfect before leaving the house. He was a fan of rave music and, like most teenage boys, David hated getting up in the morning. Just like Thomas Kelly, David's death was put down to substance abuse, much to the dismay of the family. On Saturday the 26th of February, the day David Hansen was laid to rest, another body was discovered in a shed on the same allotment that Thomas Kelly had been found. The boy was slumped against a wall, a belt tightened around his neck, and a fire had been started. The police deemed it death by misadventure, concluding that this boy had also died in a tragic accident whilst experimenting with drugs. Friday the 25th of February, David Grief was spending time with his friends, hanging out at a flight in Roca. David left the flat with a local man, but said he would be back shortly. His friends waited for him, but figuring he had probably gone home, they weren't concerned. That was until they received calls from David's mother, Janet, inquiring about his whereabouts. The police were informed of the missing boy, and another family spent a restless night wondering where their child was. David was a confident and funny child, and like Hanson and Kelly, he was a responsible boy who always made sure to let his family know where he was and who he was with. All three boys came from loving families and showed no signs of drug abuse. It was heartbreaking for the families to have their sons labelled as substance abusers, not only by the police, but by the media and the general public. The circumstances surrounding their deaths and evidence that had been gathered was re-examined. In all three cases, a man had been reported either with or close to the boys' last known locations. And the shocking thing was that this man was not only known to the police, 
but he had been questioned regarding the incidents. Thomas Kelly had been seen on a bus by witnesses at 10 to 5 on the day he died. He was also seen by some friends who noticed that Thomas was with a man, and when they greeted him, he uncharacteristically ignored them. No further sightings of Thomas had been reported. The last man to be seen with Thomas Kelly was questioned and then released. He was also identified as the man who had been seen near Roker Terrace when David Hansen's body was found. He confessed committing a burglary in the area, but denied any knowledge of the teenager's death, and no further action was taken regarding it. David Grief's friends named the man who had left the flat with that fateful night. He was Stephen Greaveson, and the evidence from the crime scenes tied him to each death, either by DNA or fingerprints. The 24-year-old Greaveson had first received a criminal conviction at the age of 11, and at the time he was identified as a suspect in the three teenagers' deaths, he was in prison for the burglary he had admitted to when questioned about David Hansen's death. In January 1996, the suspect was brought to trial. He showed no remorse as he was given three life sentences. During the trial, it was revealed that he had strangled each of the boys and used fires to cover up his crimes. It was also determined he had committed sexual acts on at least one of the boys. 22 years after his mother told Simon Martin to be home for 6pm, as she watched him leave their home to play football with his friends, not realising it would be the last time she would see her son alive, his killer would finally be identified. It would take DNA to solve his murder. When semen found on Simon's body was tested, Stephen Greenson was named as the man responsible. He was convicted of the fourth murder in 2013. There were so many failings in the handling of these cases. One of the many tragedies of this case is that three teenage boys were judged not on who they were, but by the label they were given, substance abusers. It demonstrates how damaging such labels can be, as it stops us seeing them as people, and they were blamed for their own death. Three boys were good kids. They loved their families and were loyal to their friends. Their lives were taken just as they were becoming independent. teenagers experiment with drugs but at the time the police were so focused on this idea that vital clues were overlooked this was compounded by the post-mortems being unable to determine cause of deaths i wonder could this case have been solved sooner if the initial case had been scrutinized fully could further deaths have been prevented if the boys hadn't been labeled would the media have been more sympathetic sunderland was not an affluent area at the time could this have affected how much coverage the story got? And would the case have been investigated differently if the deaths involved teenage girls? What do you think?